Last week, Thomas Massey, the Republican congressman from Kentucky, became the most hated man in Washington. He tried to force the House of Representatives to travel back to D.C. to vote in person on the $2 trillion stimulus bill, which was designed as a response to the economic fallout from the coronavirus pandemic. President Trump called Massey a third-rate grandstander on Twitter, which former Secretary of State and 2004 Democratic presidential candidate John Kerry retweeted, adding that, and I quote, Congressman Massey has tested positive for being an asshole. Finally, something the president and I can agree on. But Massey's opposition to the $2 trillion spending bill and the suspension of a voting process laid out in the Constitution is no surprise to anyone who has followed his career since he first showed up in D.C. in 2012. I'm happy to talk with him now about his reservations about the Coronavirus Aid Relief and Economic Security CARES Act and how he thinks the country should be moving forward. Congressman Massey, thanks for talking. Hey, thanks for having me, Nick. Boy, there's a oh. lot to respond to, but I want to respond to yeah. those tweets first. Yeah, yeah, please do. Well, well first of all, uh, the, uh, the, the accusation that I'm a third-rate grandstander is completely unfounded. I'm at least second-rate, okay? Yes. And, and to John Kerry's tweet that I tested positive for being an a-hole, I would just say at least I haven't been symptomatic since birth. <laughs> uh, at, least, at least there was some doubt with me. In any yeah. case... Uh, Let's clear that up and uh, well, moving what, forward. Yeah, here here is a question for you. Um, you know, what were you hoping to accomplish? And you laid out in a, uh, we'll have a link to it, uh, you laid out in a long mm. series of tweets why you were calling for, you know, an actual vote on going forward with this stimulus bill, or this spending bill, rather. What What were you hoping to accomplish with that? Sorry, there was one. There was one more insult hurled at me that you didn't mention that I'm most proud of. Uh, Nancy Pelosi called me a dangerous nuisance, which to me sounds at first sounds like an oxymoron because a nuisance shouldn't be dangerous, but uh, it's just an annoyance, right? But um, I'm I'm proud if Nancy Pelosi thinks I'm a dangerous nuisance. That means I'm effective in stopping her agenda, and her agenda here was to pass a bill with nobody in Congress. I, I call it a conspiracy to subvert the Constitution. Now, when we're in session, they oftentimes do a unanimous consent. But the difference there is there's a quorum. People are present. And you, if you had an objection, you could register it. And then that would lead to a debate or and a vote, possibly. But they were uh, planning to do a unanimous consent with nobody there. Can you imagine if if we had, if I had let her get away with that, what this fourth bill that they say is coming would look like? Like if you just let her run the tables and nobody shows up to put up a you know any opposition or to put people on record, so that you know there's two things here uh, that I was trying to make a point about. Number one, uh, it's a bad bill, and we can get into that. We can, hopefully well, we can I, dissect that. Uh, we will. That. We will. Yes. But but. But first, but uh, number two, that if you're going to vote for the biggest spending bill in the history of mankind, I mean, probably FDR is blushing in his grave right now at this. Um, if you're going to if you're going to pass that, somebody should register whether they were present, were they there, did they vote yay, did they vote nay? Today, I'm I'm sitting here, Nick. This bill now it passed the Senate, 96 to nothing, and all of those. Right were registered. Those people showed up to work and they're 10 years older than us and clearly not as healthy. But um, if 96 out of 100 senators can show up, surely to goodness, you know, 218 uh, or, uh, congressmen can show up out of 435. Actually, all they needed was 216 since we don't have quite 435 right now. Um, and just show up to vote because the Constitution requires it. Like, I, I literally got my little pocket constitution back out and reread the section just to make sure I wasn't, you know, imagining this. You have to have a quorum, and and the constitution des defines a quorum as half of Congress present in order to conduct business. And Nancy Pelosi and Kevin McCarthy were telling members of Congress, "Stay home, we got this." And the reason there's several incentives for them to do it. Number one, if you're in leadership, you want to get reelected to leadership. And the, and the way you get reelected is by being popular. 
and uh, it's a popular it's popular with most congressmen, and this is unfortunate, if they hear that they can stay home and they don't have to come to work. What's also popular is that they don't have to go on record, thereby exposing themselves in the next election. Now, Ke obviously, Kevin McCarthy isn't trying to protect Democrats, and Nancy Pelosi isn't trying to protect Republicans. But what they were trying to protect were their own members of their conference, their respective conferences, from primary opponents. This bill is not going to age well, okay? On the left, you, you've got some of the Bernie bros that recognize this is cronyism, like on steroids, okay? And on the right, you've got people that realize that this puts TARP to shame, and that TARP is one of the things that spawned the Tea Party and got a lot of people elected and a lot of them unelected. So... They just didn't want to go on record. And, and so what I did is I went, uh, by the way, there's a false media narrative that I delayed the bill somehow. I actually didn't delay it. The, the mm -hmm. bill signing, much to my chagrin, it happened on time, but it wasn't my objective to delay it. In fact, I instead of surprising everybody on Friday, I went to my leaders, the Republican leadership, and I said, why are you telling people that if I demand a recorded vote, it's going to delay the bill by a day? They said, well, when you demand the vote, we've got to give everybody 24 hours notice to get here. I said, I'm telling you, I'm going to ask for the vote. Right. And we're 24 hours before that day is here. Instead of telling people to stay home, you need to tell them to come to Washington, D.C. now. And that's what they did. So. How many people, uh, because, you know, they're, they're, we don't know exactly, out of, out, you know, out of your count, how many people voted against this bill or would have voted against this bill had yeah. there been a recorded vote? I think there were about five or six. Mm -hmm. Can you um, name those names besides name, yourself? Uh, who, else, name, who else voted against it or would vote against it? I, I, um, I'm going to name four off the okay. top of my head. And my apologies to these members if they were going to be a yes. <laughs> you know, they can always contest it because it wasn't recorded. And if time doesn't look kindly on anybody's vote, they can switch. Right. Whatever, whatever suits them. But um, I, I know that Justin Amash was going to be a no. I know that Ken Buck was going to be a no. Ken Buck also was the strongest uh, supporter of mine in terms of getting a recorded vote and not doing this by unanimous consent. Right. Alex Mooney uh, registered his objection to the bill very strongly when he spoke against the bill. And I believe Andy Biggs was uh, was a no or was going to be a no. By the Would, way, uh, AOC have been a vote. Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, she voted uh, or she voiced some real criticism. Right. Uh, you were talking about Bernie bros who were well, bent yeah. out of shape. Well, literally every everybody who got up to speak about this bill voiced some criticism. Some Democrats said it was just a down payment and it didn't go far enough. Yeah. Some Republicans said, oh, there's stuff in here I don't like. Everybody expressed some criticism. I think you'd have to ask her, but I, I think based on her floor speech, she would have been a yes, ultimately. Mm -hmm. um, but I can't I can't speak for her. And this is the unfortunate thing about not having a vote. You can't right. infer from the speech they gave. By the way, they they accused me of grandstanding. OK. If you watched the debate, I saw four hours of of uh, at least 150 members get up and grandstand one minute at a time. Right. And I wished to speak on the substance of the bill. And uh, I went and said, OK, to the floor manager. And I said, um, when can I speak? Like, where am I here in this lineup? Because I was starting to realize that it was looking pretty bleak that they were going to allow me to speak. And they and he said, well, these other people registered an interest in speaking against the, or, or speaking on the bill before you did, and we've run out of slots, so we'll put you at the top of the waiting list. How ridiculous <laughs> is that? Like everybody, I mean, I knew somebody in Germany that said this was on the news in Germany that I was uh, objecting to this bill. How yeah. ridiculous is it for somebody to tell me on the floor of the house that I didn't express interest in speaking about this bill soon enough so I would not get one minute of the four hours. And I did not get one minute of the four hours. So do you feel like, um, you know, what what do you feel like you accomplished, uh, you know, by raising mm. this ruckus? I mean, you got a lot of coverage. <clears throat> you know, what did you accomplish? And also, you know, what does it feel like to be I mean, you are you had everybody's anger in the you know, in the media and in Washington, D.C., you know, directed at you like a laser. What's that feel like? 
Well, one of the things I accomplished, I got everybody to read Article 1, Section 5 um, of the Constitution. And by the way, I was right. They, had, they drug a quorum there, kicking and screaming, okay? I, because I was right yeah. on the Constitution. Uh, what did I hope to accomplish? One of the, th so, you know, a lot of people looked at this, even my strong supporters said, go, don't go down there and set yourself on fire, right? Because we want you to come back to Congress. So even the people that support what I did, uh, generally, some of them wanted to know, like you just asked, what was I hoping mm -hmm. to accomplish? Well, uh, they're, they're already talking about a fourth bill, okay? Mm -hmm. And I can tell you it's going to be more liberal, if that's a, a proper term. It's going to be more of Nancy Pelosi's liking, okay, the fourth one. It's going to have more spending, and it's going to have probably some more draconian stuff in it in terms of government overreach. And it, if nobody had objected to this bill passing with nobody there, can you imagine a month from now when, the, when it's harder to travel, and there are more congressmen infected with the virus. Can you imagine somebody trying to register an objection a month from now after having let this one pass uh, last Friday without an objection? It would have been impossible. So one of the things that I've accomplished here, Nick, is, is I have set down a marker that people can expect that the fourth bill is going to require somebody to attend. And if they're not going to attend, they have to do it by remote voting. And by the way, if they do it by remote voting, you got to go on the record if you're going to right. do remote voting, right? You can't yell yays and nays through a telephone. Well, and like, that's you're not against you're not against remote voting, right? I mean, you're you're a tech guy. Yeah. There's obviously there's got to be a way by which Congress can legitimately register votes, you know, over the phone or something, right? I'm I'm not against it. Uh, and by the way, it's different in one very important regard from mail-in ballots in elections. Mm -hmm. with, a, with a mail in ballot that's supposed to be an anonymous choice. Mm -hmm. And uh, in Congress, you're supposed to own your vote, right? Mm -hmm. So the fraud, how could there be fraud if you have 435 members and there's a roll call that's printed and a member can look at it and say, yes, that is how I voted. Like there's a built in yeah you know, thing that keeps fraud from happening there. I think we should have, certainly we should be having remote hearings right now. We need to get three or four of these doctors in a room that disagree and they need to pr produce their data and their models mm -hmm. and let's and let's see who's got the right model and let's, you know, defend it. And, right. and the same thing with the economists uh, that are justifying pumping $6 trillion into the economy here in the course of a few months. Can we, I mean, before we talk about the the actual particulars of the bill and the larger government response to coronavirus, um, you know, some of your critics said, you know, what what are you doing? You you mentioned that the Senate, you know, they're ten years older than you. Their average age is a hundred, but people were saying, you know, you're bringing uh, you're bringing sick potentially sick people. You're pulling Congress into that. A number of congressmen or uh, representatives have tested positive for coronavirus or, or presumed to have it. Was that is that at all a risk that you you know that you should have taken into account? Well, to get a quorum, you only need half of Congress, and uh, I'm pretty sure there's some congressmen who are uh, infected that we don't know about yet, and they may even suspect mm -hmm. they're infected. But I'm pretty sure over half of Congress is not infected. Like mm -hmm. you could make a choice to stay home. Um, and you could explain that to your constituents. I mean, right. several have self-quarantined already uh, because of exposure. Senator Rand Paul self-quarantined. Mm -hmm. uh, now, here's, here's my problem with the argument that the congressmen are making saying they shouldn't get exposed. They shouldn't be exposed during their travels to uh, this virus, that they're, they need to stay home. They're asking the truck drivers to go to work every day. They're asking the, the farmers to go out and spread fertilize on their field, which by the way, does it involve interacting with people. Do you think the fertilize just shows up on the farm? No, you have to go buy it, okay? They're acting, they're asking the warehouse workers at Amazon to keep going to work so they can buy it now, so the congressman can buy it now. They're asking the UPS driver to go to work and you're telling me that a congressman who makes $174,000 a year and has a, a really good health care plan paid for by the taxpayer can't come to work when the Constitution compels them. 
as my colleague Matt Gates said, and by the way, I think he probably would have been one of the no's. I'm not sure on this. Mm -hmm. But um, he certainly did support my effort to require people to come to Congress. He pointed out congressmen used to ride on horseback and sometimes through, sometimes through hot wars mm -hmm. in our country to get there, right? Yeah. Like, this is, this is not... Uh, a valid excuse for running over the Constitution. So they so, they should have come to it. So let's uh, let's talk about the first the public health response of the you know that the federal government Donald Trump is pushing. Uh, th different governors are doing different things. But how would you characterize the federal government's response, particularly the role of the uh, uh, CDC and the FDA? Have they uh, covered themselves in glory, or is has the federal government? really kind of screwed the pooch going, you know, from, from day one with all this. They've screwed the pooch with the messaging. Okay. I'm, I never really counted on them to be that competent uh, in terms of like saving us hmm. in any scenario, but their messaging should have been better because that's the one thing you could expect they could do. They could step up to a microphone and give good advice. Let me tell you two of the biggest lies right, right after I'm the government and I'm here to help. Um, the second biggest lie after I'm the government and I'm here to help is that these uh, face masks only confer benefits to doctors and nurses, right? Like look in Japan. You know, I've been to Japan several times. They, they wear them during allergy season or cold season or flu season. Like it's a, it's a cultural thing. And, you know, I know it's called N95 because it's 95% effective at stopping particles, right? And if you don't put it on well, it's an N80. OK, or an N50, but it still confers some benefit. And for the health professionals and the politicians to, who are advised by uh, ostensibly or presumably advised by CDC to step up there and say, don't wear a mask. That's harmful. That's worse than being uh, not fully forthcoming. It's harmful. I, I think a lot of people could go to work. And the employer, in addition to handing the safety glasses and a hairnet, if they handed them a face mask and propped the door open, okay, it may cost a little more to heat the building if the door's propped, but now a thousand people don't need to touch the same door handle. Like, right. there's a lot of common sense things we could do if the government would quit lying. So that's, that's one of the lies. The other lie that I've heard recently is that we don't want everybody tested. Okay, that's... That's false. Like what we want is like a test that costs ten dollars that anybody could take at home before they go to work that day, right? That's what we want. Now, in both of those cases, what they're trying to do, they're assuming the American public doesn't understand the concept of scarcity. And there's there and so it's valid to say we want the nurses and doctors and first responders to have the PPE before everybody else has it. That's valid. It's, it's responsible to say, you know what, we've only got the capacity to test 10,000 people today, and we need to test the 10,000 that we suspect most have it, right? right? But don't lie to us when you're delivering that message. And that's the, the CDC has allowed the politicians to lie, either through being complacent uh, when the message is given by the politician with the imprimatur of the CDC standing there, right? So what, uh, that's where they've well, been unhelpful. What, what countries or what states and, and localities in the U.S. do you think have been exemplary in the response to the coronavirus? I don't know enough about hmm. the other countries. I mean, just looking at the graphs, I would have to assume that Japan and Korea, are, South Korea, mm -hmm. are doing a good job. Yeah. But looking, but also you would have to infer North Korea is doing a great job, right, if you're just right. going yeah. by the self-reporting. Uh that's a joke, folks. OK, yes. I know somebody's going to clip that out and yeah. say and make an ad out of it. Uh, and I'm so I'm not even going to repeat it. But yeah. um, so but I'm not quite sure. I can tell you that I don't approve of the job my own state is doing right now. Uh, how uh, so? What 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 is Kentucky doing? That's so wrong. And by the way, the, the answer in New York may be different than the answer in Kentucky and the answer in New York City may be different than the answer in upstate New York, okay? Right. But <clears throat> one of the, you know, just shutting everything down. Here's, here's what we're gonna get to the point of, Nick. We're gonna have more deaths by suicide and diabetes and alcoholism than we are from the coronavirus if we stay on the trajectory that my governor chose. And 
when you shut something down, what you owe the people is your criteria for shutting it down so we can understand your criteria for opening it back up. And then we can know whether to buy one week of toilet paper or one year of toilet paper. Like mm-hmm. people first started laughing at the folks who were buying all this toilet paper. And, and I agree, there might be more important things uh, if you're locked up at your house than toilet paper. But was it irrational to buy four months of toilet paper when the government was saying, oh, it's just going to be a week? Mm-hmm. And then they say, now it's going to be two weeks and we'll be open at Easter. And now we're saying April 30th. My wife's got the best analogy for it. She says we're in airport mode. We're mm-hmm. sitting in the airport and, and they come on the intercom and says your flight's been delayed 25 minutes. They, they give you no expectation of whether there will be another delay and what their criteria was for delaying it. Then they come back on, well, we've added another hour to your delay. And pretty soon they keep incrementally telling you what they should have told you to begin with, which is this flight is probably going to get canceled. Right. And now you're looking for a hotel. That's the mode we're in. And we owe, we are owed the truth. If the governors are, are working under certain assumptions, tell us what those assumptions are. Right. And then we could we can decide if it's valid. The other thing is our, our uh, governor early on, uh, I don't, I'm not sure if it was the governor or the local uh, county judge that ordered this, but the governor certainly took credit for it. They sent a sheriff's deputy to somebody's house to make sure they didn't leave their house because they suspected they had the virus. And, they, uh, and there are different versions of this story as there always are. The, the wife of the man who they sought to restrain says that the hospital never even gave them results of the test and still wouldn't share them with them. But I, you know, social distancing, great idea, uh, not shaking hands, uh, wearing the, the mask, not congregating a lot, uh, self-isolation if you've got some of the light symptoms. Those are all good ideas. But when you order those at the point of a gun, now you've got tyranny. They go from being good ideas to being tyrannical. We are not China. The stuff we saw in China uh, uh, two months ago that appalled us. You know, we always criticize them for cracking down on the churches. Well, now you can't go to church in Kentucky. And people have accepted it. as I mean, they've accepted it somewhat out of trying to do their uh, sort of their, their social obligation. They're, they're well-meaning people. Right. And... Uh, but the, the fact that the governor has ordered it and is willing, you know, there was a, uh, a church that was putting together food in boxes so that they could distribute it to people who couldn't get out from the houses who were told to self-quarantine. The local health department came uh, with the police and shut it down because they said they weren't observing the social distancing when they were putting the boxes together. That's a problem for me. What uh, let's talk about the economic uh, ramifications of this. You know, they the national economy has effectively been shut down by all of this. Um, what do you think? You're, you're you're libertarian leaning. You are limited government. When the government mandates the, you know, the closing of the economy, what is the government's role or responsibility to make sure that people have enough food, have enough health care, things like that? And, you know, and then how does that how do your what you would say are the legitimate role of government in something like this? How does that match up with the the two trillion plus spending bill that was just passed? Well, some of my colleagues make a compelling argument that this is a taking by the government. When you take somebody's livelihood by restraining them, that you owe them some remuneration for, you know, for those damages. And and that's a compelling argument to me. The problem we have here is that it's not? It's the governors who are taking, and the natural uh, feedback mechanism to keep them from taking too much would be that when they shut their own economy down, they deprive their state of uh, government of revenues, and they can't pay the state workers. And so the governors would there's this feedback that would incentivize them to take a of the a rational approach instead of just shutting everything down. What we're doing now is the federal government is uh, making people whole or or Mm -hmm. trying to make people whole with this bill. $1,200 ain't going to do it. It doesn't give you your life back. And so this this third coronavirus bill, the $2 trillion bill, is basically setting up a moral hazard for the governors. The governors who haven't shut everything down now have an incentive to shut more down. 
And the, shov- the governors who shut everything down, maybe uh, over an overreaction, <laughs> they're now being told to keep it shut down and incentivized to do that. And so I think we've broken the feedback loop. The state, if the state government takes something from you, the state government should give it back to you. Mm-hmm. Now, it's not to say the federal government doesn't have a role here in fighting the virus. I believe they do. What is, um, you know, in terms of the money that is being shoveled out now or, or will eventually be shoveled out to people, you know, some of it is going directly to individuals. A lot of it, a majority of it is going to business corporations, other entities. Um, you know, what's the most egregious egregious aspect for you? Like what sums up uh, the, the cronyism that you talked about? What's, what's the worst <clears throat> part of that? Well, you know, a lot of people have, have pointed out that Pelosi got $25 million for the Kennedy Center. Right. And and that is deplorable for somebody to stick something like that in there. But two tri- a trillion is a million millions, okay? Like you could have a million, million dollar earmarks in this bill and it still wouldn't make up half of the bill. Mm-hmm. Like, <laughs> and we're going to find out eventually what all the earmarks were. But that's that's not the most uh, egregious a part of this bill, in my opinion. Let's just do a rough top line calculation here. The government, uh, this stimulus package is $6 trillion. It's either going to be sp- uh, spent or, bar- or, or loaned or injected into the economy. $6 trillion. There are 100 million families. Okay, let's say the average family is three and a half people. 100 million families in the United States. Desi- divide six trillion by hundred million. You get sixty thousand dollars per household of spending. Okay, and and, and like uh, you know what, three and a half trillion or four trillion dollars is coming out of Fed money, right? Yeah, yeah, right. Yeah. The four trillion okay. is Treasury, Treasury yeah. and Fed, exactly. So two from Congress, four from the Fed. That should tell you who runs this government, right? right. Like if. if you know, we're already, so we complain that we Congress really only, only like only decides how a, a trillion dollars gets spent every year. Three trillion right. is entitlements. Now we're talking about four trillion. That's from a, a, a totally different set here. But yeah. back to my math: six trillion dollars total divided by a hundred million families is sixty thousand dollars per family. Okay, they're they're offering twelve hundred dollar payments to each working adult if they qualify, right. and then f- like five hundred per child or whatever. A family might expect to get three thousand dollars, but sixty thousand dollars is going somewhere on their behalf. Mm-hmm. That what's the problem here? That's like ninety five percent of the money is going somewhere else. Where is it going? Yeah, it's it's I, I'm and and who's going to be responsible for the sixty thousand? The, the taxpayer, and most of the taxes come from people, not from, from companies, not right. from the corporate taxes. The taxpayer is on the, on the line for $60,000, yet they're going to receive at most maybe $3,000 of benefit from this. I'm saying this is the largest uh, transfer of wealth in human history. It would make yeah. FDR blush, and the Roman emperors would have no idea how to pull this off. This kind of what, what would be what would be a better you know what what is your actual alternative to that? Though? Okay, um, yeah. You know, how what you know what should we be doing? In uh, you know Thomas Massey, you are the Speaker of the House, uh, or even better, you're the you're the head of the Fed, so you you're actually <laughs> calling the shots. What should we be if doing? I, well, if I was the head of the Fed, I would turn it <laughs> off. But uh, let's go back to Speaker of the House. Yeah. Um, or, or, or let's just say this bill had been debated in a committee and amended right. in a committee, and I was on the committee of jurisdiction, right? What, as a, why do I have to imagine that I'm somebody else to have an effect on the government? I'm a freaking <laughs> congressman, right? But you, but you've right. exposed the reality. The speaker's yeah. calling all the shots, and a few lobbyists. Okay, so <clears throat> let's say I had a seat at the table like the founders envisioned, and and I was on a committee of jurisdiction. I would point out that every American needs tested. And if the test costs $100 to perform, which is a high estimate, Mm -hmm. considering how many of these tests are eventually gonna happen, $100 times 350 million people is 35 billion. That's one half of 1% of 6 trillion. Like for one half of 1% of what we're spending in this bill, you could test every American. And, and, 
And actually, you could probably test them all 10 times because we're going to get the price of this test down to probably $10, okay? Right. This is going to be like a pregnancy test or something, um, <clears throat> eventually. And we're, and we're going to need something like that. So what would Thomas Massey do? Thomas Massey would have a Manhattan Project, okay? When we were attacked at Pearl Harbor, did we come up with a $2 trillion stimulus package or did we, fight, or did we declare war on our enemies? We declared war on our enemies. Why have we not declared war on this virus? Why is our first instinct to make sure that the rich people is keep all their riches? Okay, why is that our first instinct? We need to be fighting the virus. So let's do a Manhattan Project against this virus. Let's do a Manhattan Project that comes up with a, a 3D printed uh, ventilator, right? Let's do a Manhattan Project that figures out how to get these everybody uh, a week supply of masks. Everybody, not just the healthcare workers. Um, let's, let's do those kind. let's work on the vaccine. Let's have a Manhattan project on the vaccine. That's where all the money should be going because until we defeat this virus, what you're proposing is we're going to have multiple $2 trillion bills. Um, and we're not even addressing the problem. Like I, I, I really do believe everybody, whether you're a celebrity or a politician or a grocery store bagger should be able to get this test. And right now that's not the case. You know, there was a bill passed that said we're going to pay for them or that somebody's health insurance will pay for it. Nobody has to pay for the test. What the hell good is that if you can't get the test, if somebody's going to pay for it? So we need to, that's what I would do. I would declare a war on the virus, not a war on our taxpayers. Mm -hmm. What, uh, you know, uh, your your colleague, uh, Justin Amash, tweeted uh, last week, you know, that 10 years ago, the Tea Party had, you know, risen up after the uh, the bailouts that started under George Bush and Republicans and continued and expanded under Obama, Barack Obama and Democratic Congresses and, you know, bipartisan Congresses. Uh, he said, you know, the Tea Party is over. Um, is there any possibility of spending restraint left or, or the limitation of government? Um, you know, and we can argue over whether or not it's legitimate or not. But I mean, you know, where where are we? You you were you came into office uh, you know through a special election in 2012, affiliated very heavily with the Tea Party, you know, you, you know it was of uh, you know uh, all of the Republicans in the House and most of them in the in the Senate voted in favor of this. Is there any party that stands up for you know reducing spending anytime soon? You know, you saw this with TARP, too. There were a lot of yeah. people that ultimately voted for that who at the time said they were conservative, but they, right. were, they were celebrating that. They were rushing back to vote for it, right? Uh, and, uh, you know, here's, here's the one thing that you have to, you have to look and under, you have to ask, why was the world so mad at me or Washington, D.C., for being one dissenter? I didn't delay the bill a bit, right? And, at the, and because there was no recorded vote, do you know that the president and Kevin McCarthy announced at the bill signing that this was unanimous, that there was no dissension? Now, that's, that's about as ridiculous as saying I, I didn't express an interest in joining the debate on this bill, right? right? Uh, obviously, there was a dissenter. I was, I, you know, er, not everybody, but a lot of people were hating me for, for uh, 24 hours, and by the way, I gave them the opportunity to hate me because I telegraphed to the leadership. I didn't telegraph. I just flat out told them, I'm going to ask for a vote. I gave them notice so they could get a, a quorum there so that I wouldn't be delaying the bill, so that we could do it constitutionally. But in doing that, I opened myself up to more hate. Now, why did they hate it? Why did they hate? Why is, why is uh, 400 and... 34 to one, so much worse than 435 to zero. Because the one gives the people hope. The one gives the Tea Party hope that not everybody has sold out, that there is a chance that you could get somebody in Washington, D.C. that wouldn't go along with the nonsense. And so what I've discovered, Nick, in, in being this one person, when I first stepped out there in front, I had longtime supporters texting me. I mean, they've got my cell phone number. They've had it for 10 years. They're calling me up saying, don't do this. What are you doing? You're crazy. It's just bad idea. Don't stop this. We need this. But within the course of 24 hours, I had some of those same people text me and say, I'm sorry. I didn't realize what you were doing and how important it was. But what I was able to do by being one person that people could hang their objections, you know, on, 
uh, and say, you know, I, I do my this little thought in the back of my head that maybe this bill ain't the right thing to do. If one congressman, I mean, there wasn't even a senator that was mm-hmm. able to express an objection. If one congressman can do it, then maybe I'm not crazy for thinking two trillion dollars is crazy, yeah. right? And and so, anyways, I think the Tea Party's still alive, and I've seen it. I've seen it uh, raise up here in the last 72 hours. Would you, um, you know, can you say just a, as a final thought, um, is there anything good that's going to come out of this? I mean, this is a, you know, an unprecedented kind of development in American history. You know, it's 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 not war. Um, you know, it is not an economic collapse like in the Great Depression or even in 2008 or something like that. But is there anything good that's coming out of this? I mean, we've shut down the economy. People are, you know, scared. Uh, a certain number of people are going to die. Um, but, you know, is there is there something good that we can, uh, do you think, that will come out of this moment in history? We'll probably wrestle with this virus for a couple years, okay? It's going to flare up and come back and it's not going to go away like Ebola or whatever. You know, that was a scare. Um, I think the good thing that will come out of it is maybe a, a more um, practical or scientific-based response, an economic-based response to the next time this happens. Like, this is this is a test run, and we found out that a lot of people will do some things we didn't think they would do, including our government. And, and, I, and depending on who writes the history books here, hopefully they'll go back and sift through the data and they'll find out that some of the things that were done were wrong and some of the things that should have been done weren't done. And that'll prepare us uh, in the future for this. I'm, I'm hopeful about that if we haven't wrecked this country and our economy by then. My, my problem is there's so much sort of socialism and central planning and big government. I mean, you've got government deciding what's essential and what's not. What That's the definition of central planning. You've got government telling you when to go to work um, and how long to work and what things you can buy and what you can't buy. That's central planning on steroids. I hope we have enough data and I hope there are enough people that can look objectively at that data when it's over with to show that we the aspects of this that saved us were free market and innovation and individuals and not the government. Maybe when this is over with, people have less confidence in the government, a realistic view of what government's role is. I can be hopeful about that. The danger is that people get a little taste of socialism. $1,200 is the cheese in the trap here, I've been telling people. And if, if people realize it was the cheese in the trap when it's over with, then that's good. If they don't, then it's bad because they're going to be asking for $2,400 after that. Yeah. Well, but we're going to I'm leave. hopeful overall, Nick. All right. Well, I'm glad to hear that. And uh, hopefully we'll be through this as quickly as possible. I want to thank, uh, thank Congressman Thomas Massey for talking to reason. Congressman Massey, thanks very much. Thanks for having me on your show, Nick.